In this video we're going to be taking a look at a piece of vintage test equipment, the Heathkit IG42 laboratory type signal generator. An RF signal generator is a device that produces radio frequency signals of known frequency and output voltage level, often both as a continuous signal as well as one that's amplitude modulated. They were commonly used for testing and aligning radio receivers. Instruments like the IG42 were mainly intended for testing AM broadcast band and shortwave radios, for which the requirements were to cover from the lowest IF frequencies, just under 200 kilohertz, up to 30 megahertz, the typical upper range of shortwave receivers. This didn't meet the needs of FM radio or television receivers, for which other specialized instruments were typically used. Like most Heath kits, the IG42 was sold only as a kit that the buyer would assemble. It sold for about $59 at introduction in 1962, which is equivalent to about $500 today. The IG42 model was sold from 1962 to 1979. It replaced the earlier LG1 model, which was electrically identical but had different styling. The IG42 was replaced by the IG5242 in 1979, which was also almost electrically identical but again changed the styling somewhat. As the same basic circuit was used in the LG1, IG42, and IG5242 from 1952 to 1980, it was one of the longest lived Heathkit designs. The IG42 can produce RF output in five bands. Band A is 100 to 290 kilohertz. Band B is 280 to 1000 kilohertz. Band C is 0.95 to 3.1 megahertz. Band D is 2.9 to 9.5 megahertz. And band E, 9 to 31 megahertz. The Heathkit manual and catalogs typically refer to frequencies in units of cycles, kilocycles, and megacycles, which was common usage at the time. The maximum output level is at least 100,000 microvolts, or 0.1 volt, on all ranges. The output impedance is 50 ohms. An attenuator provides five fixed steps at multiples of 10, times 1, times 10, times 100, times 1,000, and times 10,000, and a continuously adjustable fine attenuator adjusts over 10 to 1 range within each level. It can produce continuous unmodulated RF output, or can amplitude modulate the output at a fixed frequency of about 400 hertz, or using an external modulation input. The modulation level is adjustable from 0 to 50 percent. A meter indicates the output level in microvolts from 0 to 10, or the output modulation level from 0 to 50 percent. Note that the output voltage level is based on the generator being correctly terminated. Accuracy of the instrument is listed in the manual as the following. Frequency accuracy from 100 kilohertz to 30 megahertz is plus or minus 3 percent of the dial reading. RF output voltage accuracy from 5 to 100,000 microvolts is plus or minus 20 percent of the meter reading and modulation accuracy from 0 to 50 percent is plus or minus 5 percent of the meter reading. I should say a few words about why Heathkit called this a laboratory type instrument. At the time Heathkit also offered lower cost RF signal generators like the IG102 at slightly less than half the price of this one. The IG42 was a higher end instrument which included a number of features not in the less expensive models. Specifically, the output level was accurately calibrated and indicated on a meter. It made heavy use of copper plated shielding. It included a line filter to minimize signal leakage into the AC line. It used a regulated power supply to minimize changes in output frequency and level due to line voltage changes. And it featured a large mechanically stable chassis and case and a large tuning dial. The tube lineup is the following, a 6AF4 oscillator, 6AV5 grid modulated amplifier, a 12AU7 audio oscillator and modulator tube, this is a dual tube, and a 0B2 voltage regulator. It operates from 105 to 125 volts AC, 50 or 60 hertz. The dimensions are 13 inches wide by 8.5 inches high by 7 inches deep and it weighs about 10 pounds. Let's take a look at the front panel controls and see the unit operating. The RF output is via the connector on the lower right. This unit has a BNC type connector, but the instrument would have originally shipped with an old Amphenol microphone type connector like this one. The terminals at the lower left are used to connect an external modulation input source if used. The function switch selected the operating mode, AC off, standby where the tube heaters are powered up but the high voltage power supply is not switched on. 
CW for continuous wave where the instrument would produce a continuous unmodulated RF output. MCW or modulated continuous wave where the instrument will produce an amplitude modulated output. And EXT where the unit would amplitude modulate the output using the external audio input. In any mode other than AC off, the pilot light comes on to indicate power. The large tuning dial in the center has a vernier reduction drive and selects the output frequency as indicated on the dial markings for each of the bands A through E. The bands overlap slightly, allowing the output to cover any frequency from 100 kilohertz to 30 megahertz. The range switch selects from five ranges A through E. All outputs are on the fundamental frequency. The step attenuator control divides the output level down by multiples of 10 in five steps. The fine attenuator is continuously variable and adjusts the output level over a 10 to 1 range for the selected step. The meter switch selected whether the meter shows the RF carrier output voltage or the modulation percentage. In the RF carrier position, the meter indicates the RMS output voltage level in microvolts from 0 to 10, which must be multiplied by the step attenuator switch settings. So for example, on the times 1K switch setting, the meter reads in thousands of microvolts from 0 to 10. In MCW mode, the instrument modulates the output with an internal approximately 400 hertz audio signal. The modulation control adjusts the modulation level. With the meter switch in the mod position, the meter now shows the modulation level from 0 to 50 percent. With the function switch in the EXT position, the output level is modulated by an external audio signal which must be from 60 to 10,000 hertz. The modulation control adjusts the level of modulation, but the meter will not accurately reflect the percentage modulation in this case. Here's a look at the unmodulated output on an oscilloscope. It's on range A, and the frequency is about 200 kilohertz. Note that the output is not a pure sine wave. This is harmless and sometimes desired so the generator could be used beyond 30 megahertz on harmonics. Adjusting the fine attenuator control controls the output which you can see on the meter and on the oscilloscope. Changing the step attenuator switches it by factors of 10. We can switch ranges and see the output at higher frequencies. The output level varies slightly with range and frequency, but the meter can be used to adjust to a known level. In modulated CW mode, we can see the RF signal modulated by an audio frequency. On an AM radio tuned to the frequency, you would hear the audio tone. The modulation control adjusts the level of modulation from 0 to 50 percent or more. The instrument's meter indicates the modulation level when in mod mode. If we tap into the audio oscillator signal, we can see it's a reasonably clean sine wave. Nominally 400 hertz, mine measures at a little under 300 hertz. Another way to look at a modulated RF signal is the so-called trapezoidal pattern. This is achieved by connecting an oscilloscope in XY mode with the vertical channel connected to the RF signal and the horizontal to the AF. The trapezoid changes shape from a vertical bar to a triangle as we move from zero towards 100% modulation. Looking inside, you can see quite a complex assembly of chassis and shielded compartments. All the metal except the outer case is copper plated to make it more conductive. All wiring is point to point with no printed circuit boards or factory assembled wiring harnesses. You do lace together some wires with string or cord to keep them neat. This small chassis is the line filter assembly. During assembly, a piece of metal referred to as a jig was supplied to hold the line filter assembly in place on the chassis so it didn't flap around in the breeze and potentially break, short to something, or be touched when powered up. This is long gone, so you need to use caution when the unit's out of the chassis, especially when it's powered up. At left is the power transformer, and below it is the selenium rectifier and related components. To the left of the transformer, mounted on the front panel, is the meter and a shielded compartment below for the attenuators. 
Opening this up, you can see there's heavy shielding in this area to minimize any coupling that would reduce the accuracy of the attenuators at low levels. And in fact, the front and rear wafers of the attenuator switch are shielded from each other. On the right is a chassis with the 0B2 and 12AU7 tubes, electrolytic filter caps, and power supply filter choke. The 0B2 is a gas regulator tube. Similar to a neon lamp, it regulates the power supply voltage by firing or conducting at about 133 volts and maintaining a voltage of about 108 volts across it. It doesn't get hot, but the inert gases inside glow when it's conducting. Underneath the chassis is wiring and additional components including the trimmer pots and a choke for the audio frequency oscillator. On the front panel are controls, switches and connectors. The fine attenuator, tuning and range controls are inside a shielded compartment and attached by insulated rods. In the center is the shielded RF oscillator section. The 6AF4 and 6AB5 tubes are mounted externally but have a shield placed over them. Opening up the rear shield, we can see the tube socket wiring, frequency control capacitor, and output level pot. Inside yet another shield is the frequency range control, which has five different tuning coils. I won't open it up as it requires a lot of disassembly. Note that there's triple shielding here, the oscillator coil shielding, the oscillator section shield, and finally the metal instrument case. There's a metal grommet in the shield cover that allows you to adjust a trimmer for the RF oscillator calibration while the cover is still in place. I bought this unit from a local seller on Kijiji in June of 2019. He had bought it as part of a lot of electronics at a sale and didn't really know what it was. It came without an original manual. I found some copies of the full manual and schematics on the internet. The manuals of the typical high quality of Heath kits with detailed assembly instructions. There's a significant amount of effort to assemble this kit due to the complex chassis and shielding. The manual is about 35 pages long and has a short circuit description as well as several pages describing some typical applications for radio servicing. The unit was in pretty good cosmetic shape. Some screws on the back are not original or missing and the meter has some marks on it. I gave it a good cleaning inside it out and lubricated the controls. The tubes are likely not all original. Two are RCA and two are Mullard made in England, one of which is a European ECC82 version of the 12AU7. The original output connector had been replaced with a more modern BNC connector, a modification you commonly see, and a change that Heathkit made in the later IG5242 model. The output cable was missing. Originally it was part of the kit and consisted of an amphenol connector, a length of coax cable, and a plastic connector terminated with a 51 ohm resistor and some banana jacks. I measured the values of all caps and resistors and they were okay with most resistors having increased a little in value over the years. The filter caps measured okay as far as value and ESR. After visual inspection I powered the unit up slowly on a Variac. It came up and produced output on all bands. Modulation was working and the regulator tube kicked in when the input voltage passed about 100 volts AC. I followed the initial tests in the manual which just checked that the regulator tube and other tubes are powered up and there's output. The frequency calibration was pretty much right on. You adjust it by sending an AM radio to a station near 900 kilohertz and adjust the generator for a zero beat on the radio. Then adjust the trimmer cap so the dial is correct. I used a frequency counter and set the output dial to 900 kilohertz and it was pretty much bang on as is. Two of the controls were noisy, but some contact cleaner fixed it up. Calibration is not required, but can be done if the builder has the necessary test equipment. Calibrating consists of adjusting the output before the attenuator to 2 volts RMS as read on a VTVM or similar AC voltmeter, and then adjusting a calibration pot so the meter reads full scale. The modulation range on the meter is adjusted by observing the modulated output on an oscilloscope. The modulation control is adjusted for 33% modulation, defined as the maximum peak-to-peak -peak signal being two times the minimum, and then the modulation calibration pot is adjusted so the unit's meter reads 33%. These adjustments can be done before all the shielding is assembled. 
A table in the manual lists the expected voltages at each pin of each tube to help diagnose problems. I checked all the voltages against the manual and they all matched within nominal limits. I decided to keep this unit original and not replace parts unless they were bad. If I was to use this on a regular basis, I would make a few changes to make it safer. I'd replace the paper caps and electrolytic caps with new ones. Replace the selenium rectifier with a modern silicon diode with a suitable voltage dropping resistor, or maybe even use a full wave rectifier bridge. Add a fuse and a three wire grounded line cord, and replace the caps in the line filter with modern safety caps. The unit was designed for 117 volts AC input, which was typical at the time, but today line voltages in North America are typically 120 volts AC minimum and often a few volts higher. That means that the transformer, rectifier, filter caps, and regulator tube run a little harder and hotter, so the modifications I just mentioned here are even more important. I hope you enjoyed this look at a piece of vintage test equipment. If so, check out my other YouTube videos on Heathkit products.